Hello, podcast listeners. My name is Kelly Richardson Lawson. I'm a mother, a wife, and an entrepreneur. I started the Sunrise Project after our beautiful teenage son attempted to take his own life. Truth is, I'm tired. My husband and I felt despair, isolation, and immeasurable pain. I knew in my heart we needed a place for Black parents to share their struggles, find mutual support, and help our beloved children who struggle with mental wellness, addiction, or both. Each weekly podcast features an expert who shares their knowledge and takes questions from parents and children. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. The Sunrise Project allows Black families, like ours, to find comfort in knowing that we are not alone. While the purpose of the Sunrise Project is to share, support, and uplift, this conversation is not a substitute for medical advice. Finding the right healthcare professional for your family's specific needs is crucial. If you do not feel seen or heard, you should speak to more than one professional to find the right fit. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our weekly Sunrise Project call. As always, I'm delighted that you're here with us this morning, and I hope that we all find a moment of solace and peace today as we share and learn from one another in a safe space filled with love, compassion, and the mutual desire to heal ourselves, our children, and our families. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Tamiko Ruby J and her son, Quentin. Tamiko is a Reiki master teacher and healer and a very dear friend. She is going to share with us her path to healing while also raising a son in Cleveland, um, my hometown. And she will also share her path as a single mom. And Quentin will open up and share his struggles and his journey to recovery. We first heard about Quentin when Tamiko joined us um, last year, 2020, and Mm -hmm. she shared stories that were so similar to mine and to many of us um, about some of the challenges she was dealing with or had dealt with um, in the past with Quentin. And what was so incredibly exciting for me personally is that she shared how even through all the the stress and the trauma and the drama, you know, there is hope um, because Quentin has come through all of that and has overcome and is thriving and doing really well. And so I'm just so delighted to have both of you here this morning um, to share your journey and to help us because we're all looking for, you know, uh, that silver lining and that hope at the end of what uh, um, what many of us are going through right now. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, um, Tamiko and Quentin, and just want to open it up by again saying thank you for being here and just want to, you know, hear from you in terms of when did things go awry? You know, when did you look at your little beautiful young man, Tamiko, and say, what in the world is going on? <laughs> Can you share the beginning? How did things get started, please? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that um, beautiful opening. And going, here we go, Matt. Um, so uh, I would say it all started to go awry. I mean, I wanted to start with um, with him being my only child and being the um, first grandchild. And I had him young, you know. Um, I was legal, but I was young. And always raising him to, you know, you are a future king. You will, you are a prince. You are to stand up for yourself. You are to speak up for yourself um, and all of these fun things. And as I started to see things kind of start to take a curve or a swerve around 16, 17-ish, it really hit me like, wow, this is a different situation when he graduated from high school, really, because at that moment, the, his graduation, I realized that he was the only black male graduating in his class in 2002, two, three, whenever it was. There was other black students at Mayfield High School, but the three or four others were underclassmen. The other students that I would see, they were students that were coming for, um, he was in an interactive media program at Mayfield, but it, it, at that moment, it it just was like a chin check, like, wow, 
there were two females and then two black females and then Clinton and this whole student student body of like 300 graduates. And at that moment, I kind of, it like, again, it hadn't even registered. You know, my thing was um, even going back a little younger when we were talking about high school and, and things of that nature. And I was um, thinking of putting him in a, in a more private school and one of the really good, cause he was in the sports. And I was looking at some schools, St. Ignatius, anybody from the Cleveland area or um, Benedictine and Quentin was adamant that if you put me in an all boys school, I will never go. I'm not going to an all boys school. So if we want to say it probably kind of started there where I was paying attention, but by the time it took a loop was graduation and then going into, you know, that boy to man phase. Like I said, really involved in sports. There were some things that happened even in the sports thing where grades had kind of dropped and um my thing at that time was, you know, you can, sports are sidebar. So my exact words were, you could be an athlete or you could be dumb, but you won't be both. Because what had happened was he had a D in like English and within a week's time, because they wanted him to start for a football game. And that, that D went to a B and all he did was one paper. And I was like, oh no, we're not having this. So I benched him. And that did not go over well with the coaches. And I was like, I don't care if, I know you can run, okay? I know, you, but this is not gonna be the only thing that we do. So I think from that, and that was maybe, Quinn, would you say that was your like freshman year or? That was my freshman year, so. Yeah, so I think like that, that kind of set a, a interesting dynamic because now we got this very talented athlete and this very strong will mom that's like, helicoptering or I probably was more like a jet I wouldn't even say helicopter to a certain extent when it came to like his education or whatever so um I would say that that's when it probably start when I started to pay attention to it I should say um but by senior year it was like all out crazy respectful to a certain extent but I recognized that there were some things that were there but at that point he was all about, I'm just ready to be grown and out this house. And I was all about, I, I feel you. Let's, let's make that happen. <laughs> so. And just to, to piggyback off of that a little bit, um, as a freshman, I was starting a, lo- a lot of sports, um, just going into high school as a senior, like where I was starting for varsity teams. So where they develop senioritis because it's their senior year, I developed senioritis as a freshman. So everything that they were doing, I, I was doing. So if it was, you know, partying on more games or after games, I'm going to. And then when you do that as a freshman, and by the time you're sophomore or junior year come around, you're now the big dude. And so even though there's other seniors, now they, you, you're hanging out with the next group of seniors to the next group of seniors until you're the next group of seniors. So for three out of four years, I mean, that's all I did. That's all I was concerned with, sports and, and having fun. So, And then, like she said, um, by the time my senior year came, I was so old in school and ready to go. I was like, okay, well, what can I do? And I was I was pretty big-headed. Like, I had uh, Division two offers to play football, and I told them no, because <laughs> if I'm not starting, I'm not going. Uh, I had school, uh, uh, art schools in New York, reaching out to me like hey can you come to New York and you know go through our uh, interview process well and they're like can you you know they call on a Wednesday like can you be here by Friday Saturday and I'm like no and like not realizing like we're talking you know FIT Sunny University in New York which is a big fashion school and I wanted to be a fashion merchandiser kind of piggybacking off of the Sean Combs you know Sean John era Rockaware Jay-Z era so I, you know I wanted to be in that world uh for a moment and um oh that thought I just want to say this he he presented a portfolio with a minimum amount of sketches and got and got the call okay so I want to say that so it wasn't just like he did that part and then was like, yeah, no, but well, go ahead, go ahead. I just want to So why that. was it the there no? Like, why did you say no to going? 
Because I didn't like the attitude that he had. Was. <laughs> uh, basically, he told me, if you can't, we have kids coming in from Japan. If you can't make it, then, then you know. And I was like, all right, then I can't make it, bro. <laughs> That's just how it is. And I just always had that, like, the moment I sense a little bit of attitude, I was, it's an instant turn off. Clinton, did, yeah. did substances have any um, influence on you making those types of decisions? Not at that stage. I, I would say maybe alcohol at that stage. Uh, I was really concerned with my body at that point because I was an athlete. So my drinking and substance stage didn't happen until after I graduated high school. I was just very cocky, arrogant, um, know-it-all, and wanted life to be at my pace and the way I wanted to do it. Just because, like I said, at such a young age, as a freshman, hanging out with seniors, you know, we're talking, what, uh, 15, 14, 13, hanging out with 18, 19-year-olds, you know what I mean? No, I didn't do everything that they did, because, again, like I said, I would probably drink a little bit, but it wasn't to the extent that it developed to. But it, I was very concerned about my body, so I can't say substance uh, had anything to do with that at that point. It did later on, for sure. Um, I would I would piggyback that, too, Um at that time and going to the arrogance and the cockiness, a lot of that, I would say, um, because it was always like take ownership for who you are, speak up for yourself, um, all of these kind of things. And I think being in an environment because all of Quentin's middle school and high school, he was the minority and it was obvious that he was the minority. And so one of the, I mean, we had a situation in um, when he was in middle school where he had on a polo shirt, just a, you know, a casual polo, polo shirt. And he had a, a teacher ask him, do you know what that, that means? Do you, do you know what that stands for? And, you know, what? our script, our script was always um, be respectful, handle your business and then let me handle it. So in that one, that one kind of caught him a little off guard, but he, he was like, yeah, I know. Do you know? And of course that was, you know, principal's office. The, the cool, you know, it was interesting. I mean, even in high school, we got to a point where, I, I mean, I had um, reserved parking because that's how often I had to be at the school. It was kind of ridiculous, but. Um, and like I said, it was just a, a, a arrogance I had, um, a no, take BS approach from who, anyone, um, regardless of who it was. But there's a difference between uh, like respecting adults and challenging adults to when and how to do that. You know, I just went about it a lot more aggressive than the average. Everything was a challenge. Any, anything that was challenged at me, you know, like I'm coming at you, I'm not hearing anything you have to say. And the respect level between my mom and I was always there until it was like until then you know my mom always respected what I had to say and I said things and she would go okay she would listen but it was never really challenged at her until I got a little bit older and then it was like the same way I'm challenging everybody else I'm coming at you now too like everybody can get it you know and that's where I think a lot of but I have to give her credit 90% of the time she waited, she picked and chose their battles very well. So it was like, you know, I'm not gonna have this conversation with you now. Though we're gonna have a conversation because I'm gonna let you speak and I'm gonna get, let you get it out. She didn't use it as a confrontational moment. You know, she come back to me, you know, days, even weeks later sometimes, like, you know, never like soft or anything, still firm in, you know, what she believed, but just like, okay, and listening, you know, very, you know, mom face, growl, you know, I could tell she's upset, but I'm still gonna let it air it out. And then she come back to me when we're both, you know, a little more sensible. And um, she never really told me what to do, how to do it. Just, this is how I feel. This is the way I saw it, you know, and we would have those conversations. I think those conversations helped because it wasn't, yeah, 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 yeah. It was, okay, we're having a sensible conversation. I'm hearing you, you're hearing me. And now I'm evaluating myself and looking myself in the mirror going, okay, I can see that now. I can see this now. 
And I'll say one of the reasons I chose the battles like that, because usually when you were on your highest tilt, you was high as a damn kite. And I knew it. And so it's like, it didn't make sense to do it then because all I needed was one pop off and it, it would have got physical. You know, I don't have a problem with that. I'm from Cleveland. I mean, you know, if I had to take you out, then at least I know how you left. So I was like, that's not the way I want to go. And that's how I was raised. So I was like, we're not going, I'm going to try something different. The thing that was very interesting about that, let's 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 jump to Chicago because that's where it all got real. It got real um, once you got to Chicago, and um, and how you even even chose Chicago, how how you wound up there, how we even went about, you know, even at that time, you know, you're being accepted to uh, Academy of Technology and Design and um, getting the acceptance letter there was a letter that came that said that you were supposed to be there on a certain day. And you were just like, Nope, I'm not, I'm not supposed to bring my stuff on that day. And I'm like, Quentin, that's not what it's saying. And you're like that. That's what it said. That's what I'm doing. So literally I take Quentin to the airport with a duffel bag. Okay. That's the world's biggest duffel bag you ever seen, by the way. Of course. Cause we got to do it right. But, and so then he gets to Chicago only to find out that, mom was right you know people are moving in um you know he at that point um wasn't even sure where to do him up it was it was messy anybody that has been in that space I know a lot of the callers are dealing with young men that are younger but you know as a as a parent like you look forward to that day of being able to take your kid to college and set up that that room but I was like all right whatever we doing man like you know that's that's what we're doing and so I take him to the airport, I'm driving home, tears, I have to pull over, only for him to get to Chicago and be like, mom, you got to come, you got to bring my stuff like tonight. Mm, yeah, no, you got your stuff. I had to get off the phone. He's like freaking out. All right, is this, if this is how it's going to be, you know, all this craziness. And then, then you have a person that's used to having like their own wing of the house now with roommates, that was an adjustment. It was just a lot. And so I, I'll hand it over to you because now this is your story. <laughs> I mean, it gets interesting. <laughs> or well, we can, I can smile about it now. I wasn't smiling back then. Anyway, um, uh, yeah. One of the reasons I chose Chicago, my biological father was um, from Chicago. So that played a, a, a part in my thinking of, like, okay, well, maybe I could find my biological dad and get to know that side of it. So I, I, I wound up uh, going to Chicago, going to an art school. I get there the first day. Like I said, biggest duffel bag I've ever seen. I'm at O'Hara Airport and our, we had apartment housing. We didn't even have dorms because it's an art school. So it's just basically like, you know, you live in an apartment on one end and then maybe across the hallway, there's other students for and then the rest of the apartment are just regular residents, regular people living there day to day. And so I assumed that when I got to the school that I was going to a dorm campus life. So my dorm's not going to be far from the school. And uh, so I get the, I think I took the, I didn't even take the train. Yeah, I think I took the train to the school. Still didn't really know how to navigate in Chicago, but I knew, you know, they gave me enough information where if you're from O'Hara, you can take the orange line to get to downtown and then walk a couple blocks and you're at the school. So I get to the school, they give me my, you know, orientation papers and everything like that. They give me this address. What is this? And they're like, oh yeah, that's where you'll be living. Well, it's, you know, the school was downtown and this apartment was on the north side. Uh, Chicago, which is about 20, about 10 or 15 minutes out. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't even know how to get to here, you know. And while I was in the orientation, um, one of the guys who wound up being my roommate, he kind of saw I was lost and he was with his family. And so uh, we wound up going, he wound up asking me, hey, uh, you want to ride over there? I was like, sure. And then we wound up being roommates. So then we were like, close at that point, like, all right, he was my right-hand man. So um, we get there, 
and uh, there was two other kids. Now the kid I was talking about, the first kid, he was from Detroit. Uh, and then there was two other roommates that lived there, one from St. Louis and the other one from Saginaw, Michigan. And the way that it worked out, they had got there a week before we did. And me and Darnello had already paid for having our own rooms. But since they got there first, they had already set up the two rooms because the way the apartment was, it was a three bedroom. Uh, there was a room in the front, a room in the back, and then a shared room in the middle. So they had took the two single rooms and me and another were like, nah, like, that ain't gonna work. We paid for these rooms. So it was just like coming into it, it was conflict, but we, we got all that situated. So it's our first, probably for the first probably month, we would just have these crazy parties, like just party after party, day after day. I never probably, I probably went to school probably three times in the first quarter of the semester. Uh, got put on academic probation. Then I'm really condensing this story because for the second sake of time, but basically academic probation, kicked out of school, kicked out of the school apartment. So I moved down the street basically. And at that point, you know, I didn't want to come home because one, it would be like, I'm a failure. Two, you know, everybody knew uh, Quinn moved to Chicago. Like he's doing big things in Chicago. Like, so I didn't want to move back home. One, because of the failure effect. Two, because I was just loving life. Like, I was having fun still. Like, everything was fun. But that's when reality started kicking in. You know, it, it's, uh, I went from a very, I wouldn't say a very big fish, but I, I went from a big fish in a small pond to a best fish in a very, very big pond, an ocean. Or, I mean, whatever biggest body of water you can think of, I went from that to that. But still. Also, I, I, I want to just intervene there. The other thing that happened with that, once he was no longer in school um, and decided he wanted to stay in Chicago, I made it a point like, that's fine, but you're going to have to take care of yourself. So that's where it, it became very interesting. Like, all right, you can stay. We, we, the, the housing was pretty much covered at that point because we paid it up front, but it was like, I'm not funding your freedom. You got to figure that part out. So, Had you been funding the college? Uh huh. So he was. You paid for him to go to school. Okay. Uh huh. It was partial. I mean, it was loan based. Well, loans and yeah, and some um cash. It was like about ten grand cash. But um, what was interesting at that time too, you know, I, I had an idea what was going on. I remember I just popped up in Chicago just unannounced because he would do to try not to to uh when when he was really out there he would not respond. So I just drove up to Chicago one day. And I get to, and this is when I had moved him into his own place because the situation happened where it was like, all right, you, you need your own place. So we get to his own place and I drive up to Chicago, surprisingly. And when I get in the building and I'm on his floor, I can smell the, the marijuana from like the elevator, which was like halfway down the hall. And as I'm getting closer to his apartment, it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So when I finally get to the apartment and I knock on the door, he's like, he opens the door, eyes bugging out of his head, like, cause he wasn't expecting to see me. And he's like, just a minute, just a minute. And so he closes the door and I'm sure he probably was in there fan and doing whatever. So when he finally lets me in, there's like a, a, a towel underneath the door. <laughs> and I'm looking like, did you really think that was going to filter this? And I'm like, let's go for a walk. You remember that one, Quinn? Yeah. yeah. So, and we had the conversation then, like, and I wanted him to come outside and then walk and then come back in the building so that he could get an idea. Like, you might think that you in here blazed up and nobody knows, but you, this is all the way, it's obvious. And it's a beeline straight to your door. So at this point, you know, I'm trying to teachable moments, but I'm freaking out because I'm like, this, this is not good. Like, you, how is this gonna? How is this gonna play out? So I'm trying to navigate it from from that perspective, and I think at that time I'm like, if this is this is the life that you live in, then you gonna have to bring it back to Cleveland. And he was like, I'm not coming back to Cleveland, and I'm like, well, this this is not good. So you gonna have to figure this out, and you gonna have to fund it. But you, 
this is this is not what you want, man. This is really not what you want. We had another situation where he had come back to Cleveland and he was gone around some friends of mine and, you know, everybody's excited to see him. And at this point, you know, Quentin is 20, 21, no, 20. He's not, he's not, he's not 20. He was 20. You were 20. Okay. 21. And, um, everybody's excited. So they're like getting them shots and do what you do for a 21 year old. And I'm looking at the amount of alcohol that he's able to consume. And, um, he leaked, you know, he leaves his own party. We didn't even know where he had gone. He winds up back at home at the time. And let let me also say this. I think that this might have been a huge component, too. I was so fed up with just all of it. When Quinn graduated from high school, because I lived in Mayfield, it was just over the whole Mayfield thing. And like this time, at this time, I'm done. So I literally put the house, my house on the market. You know, one of those like, yeah, let's see what happens. But at that time, it was the house and market was good. I put the house on the market. The house sold within like three weeks. Like, I mean, like literally I got a bit. So while he was gone, he had just gone to his freshman year of college and I sold the house and didn't give anybody an address to where I had moved to. Okay. So that was probably another component. Cause like, you know, I would make, real strong moves and so then it was that thing like wow she just she just moved and like um when Quinn would ask for the address I'm like you I'll get it I'll give it to you when you need it you know that kind of thing so I think that that might have been a huge component also because you got all of this change and now you really don't have that's what you told me later that you really don't have a place that feels like a base because I just sold the house and literally wound up moving into our apartment because it was just like oh where am I going now but that was another component that happened in all of this change. Cause again, I'm kind of just like over it, you know? So yeah, that was another piece. The thing that I thought was, uh, and so again, when he came home, he comes to um, the place that I'm staying at that time. And he was so drunk that he wound up falling in the bathtub and he fell so hard that he literally broke the, the, nos- the spazzle in the tub like it was bent the the pipe going through the wall and he was like I'm fine and I'm thinking how hard could you have fallen where you you break um you you that th- this can happen but it was what was interesting about it was the fact that um even in that that's when I started to get an idea that this young man's in a lot of pain because if that kind of if that kind of impact did not hurt you. And he had a big bruise on his back or wherever, wherever he had hit. But if that kind of pain didn't hurt you, then that's when I knew like, all right, this is, this is deeper. There's something else going on here. And then this is what started me on my journey for healing as well, because I'm looking at all of this. I can feel and sense the pain and the discomfort that that he's in, but there's not anything that I can do versus, you know, when he was younger, he had been in therapy we talked about him going back to therapy. He was hell bent on nope. Everything was a no. So I, you know, that's what kind of got me involved in going deeper in my spiritual practice. Back to you, Quinn. Uh, so basically, when I uh, moved to the other end of the street, um, I had to take care of myself. I got a job at the dry cleaners and making minimum wage. And you know, Chicago's a very expensive city. And so I got introduced into what I what I was told was <laughs> go down to this neighborhood and tell them you want to sell knives. I'm like, okay. Like the Mary Kay kind of thing. That's what I mean. That was in my head. Was, go down to this neighborhood, you want to sell knives. So I'll go over there and I meet the guy. I'm like, yeah, I want to sell knives. I'm like, oh, you want to sell knives, huh? Yeah, yeah. So that's how I got involved. Yeah selling, you know, drugs, I guess. I don't know another way of saying it, but uh, that's how I got involved in that life. And really naive about it, not really like taking into account everything that, that entails. The characteristic changed at that point. I went from being happy, love the party, to like, I'm on point at all times. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a, not a gangster, so to speak, but I'm also not to be messed with. And just taking on a whole exterior tough persona that 
wasn't necessarily my core person, but it was um, fight or flight. And I had a lot of fight and um, just kept bubbling my head against the wall. You know, it's like every time I take a step forward, I would take a couple steps back because I was always, you know, and Chicago's not a, a great place to, if that's what you want to do, uh, or you decide to go around that route. It's not the easiest place to navigate, but being one, being smart, two, being, you know, I, I, even though I grew up in Mayfield, I wasn't like naive, like a, a average suburban, but cause you know, still been around family, still been around rough environments, but just being, learning how to navigate that world is a lot different. So um, it got to a point where it, it became too much for me to handle. So I had to come back home, but I still had a lot of that in me still. Like it wasn't just like, oh, I'm back home now, everything's back to good. No, I'm still always on point, always like aware and over analyzing everything, you know. And when you when you have to over analyze every move that somebody makes, somebody, you know, snickers wrong, it's a problem. Somebody walks past you and looks a certain way, it's a problem. Everything became I'm aware, I'm so dialed in, so in tune that, that everything is an issue. So I'm having, I'm like having self-caused issues from issues that aren't necessarily there, but I am, and I'm always at that point too. So it wasn't necessarily beneficial to anything that I was doing, but it was hard to break that, you know, um, because it was, you know, one false, move one, one, one sign of disrespect unchecked, one sign of disrespecting someone else, it's, you know, it's that serious, so. But would um, you say that that the drugs, um, and the, the drugs made that even even higher, like a, even the I, sensory I, even higher? I think it, uh, I was a, like, in a sense, sensory overload, but always, on, like, always in a sensory overload, just a kind right. of, like, uh, like I said, I would overanalyze every situation. One phone. Yeah, somebody could blink their eyes wrong, and I'd be like, oh, are you sending somebody a signal? Like, what is? what are you doing? You know, I'm just constantly, I wouldn't necessarily say a fear, but a paranoia, high, high, high level of paranoia. Because I wasn't from that. That's not how I was raised to it. It was like, and to a sense, I didn't want anyone to find out I wasn't from that, because I felt like if they found out I'm not from that, then... Uh, that could be a sign of weakness, and then you know that could lead to escalating uh, situations. So uh, I'm gonna always be the first one uh, to take it there, just to make sure you know I, I'm not a play. Which, like I said, a lot of situations could have been avoided because that's not what anybody else was going. Like they would go there because I was there, but it was like, oh, dude, <laughs> chill out, you know. So I think that's where a lot of that. During that time, I think that's where a lot more of where that that came from or, or that part of it came from. It's just that constant paranoia and, and always uh, under the influence of something. And you were back home at that point with your yeah, mom? I was. Mm-hmm. And, and so was it always marijuana and alcohol or were there other things? You don't have to say specifics, but was it always yeah, marijuana uh, and alcohol? Mm-hmm. Mostly marijuana and alcohol, you know. I never really got into any of the other stuff, but that was mostly it. Um, and then coming home, you know, my mom was like, you know, you just stay here, but you gotta get a job. So I always kept like uh, employment. I gave, you know, stop doing selling because I was back home. I'm not gonna do it in her house, you know. That's just. Uh, I still have a level of. Like, I had weird. As much as I, I wasn't, I. Had, you would think I wouldn't have value, but I still like had high morals and high values. I just had them in a very weird street level idea of it. So like, I'm not going to disrespect my mom's home and do this, you know, from her home. But if I have a place where I can do it, you know what I mean? Or, um, or I could come in drunk and, and loud and, and high as well, they're high, but, um, that's not a, a disrespectful thing in my mind, but selling drugs out of her house would be, you know, so it was- Or I'm not going to drink and get high at home, but I'll come home drunk and high. Right. That that kind of thing. 
Which is I really, really a beautiful thing because I, I think my son is doing it, you know, in the in the bathroom and the, who knows. Yeah, I've been doing like in the backyard or something like that, mm-hmm. like something where it wasn't like I'm not going to disrespect the home, but I'm still going to disrespect the home. Now that, now that I think about it in retrospect, like wow, I really like. When so did it take? Your... Oh, go ahead, go oh, ahead, Tamika. I was just going to say the same thing. When, when did, when did it change? Oh, Kelly, I think you were going to say for how long? This went on for at least a good three, uh, four years. Yeah, it was, like, it was. I would say from about nineteen to about twenty-five. I, I think around twenty-five, and I, I'll never forget the moment we had. Like, um, my mom's a very strong woman, strong will, strong uh, personality, strong everything. And from now, I know you not to contradict the story, but I know I went to Chicago for my biological father, but uh, dad, but the father figure I had in my life got killed when I was seven. So my mom had she's been strong ever since then. Like she was the mom and the father, the dad at that point. And uh, when he passed, it was you know she went into full. I would say mother soldier mode, so to speak, and you know never, uh, never wanted to show like a weakness or anything like that. Not in a bad way. She always showed love, you know what I mean. But it was just like she was just very strong. So I say it was. Uh, she asked me to come at the time. She had a salon at Beachwood. She asked me to come down there and uh, help her move some stuff. But really, when I got there, it wasn't even about the move. It was just like I just need to talk to you, you know. So you know, she's like, you know, she's telling me, you know, I'm having these premonitions, these thoughts, and I don't, I don't want to lose you. But she broke down. Now, for my mom to break down, I've seen her break down during like Beauty and the Beast or something like that, like watching a movie, but never to the emotional point of where she was. And that was an eye opener for me because some and to be vulnerable in that moment let down the guard, let down all that vulnerable. I am not only scared, I'm nervous, I'm, yeah, all these things. And she's just crying, you know. Mom, don't cry, <laughs> it's tough as they come. So it was like, and up until that point, like I said, she's always, you know, she was kind of like, let you do your thing, you'll figure it out. But at that point, it was like, okay, I have to step in. I can't let you keep trying to figure this out on your own because you're not, I don't like where this is going. So seeing her in that state, it really resonated with me. One, because it wasn't confrontational at all. At all. It was like, I'm giving mercy. Like, I don't know what to do. Uh, and for to see that, it was, and it was also like, I wasn't necessarily seeing it in myself, you know, like I, I had, wasn't seeing like oh, all I'm doing is drinking and smoking. I ain't selling drugs no more. I ain't doing it. You know what I mean? I, I'm just drinking and smoking. What's, what's the problem? But apparently it was like who I'm around, things that are going on, small things. You know, coming in the house after wrecking my car, coming in, grabbing her keys so she can leave out in the morning, and then wrecking her car in the same night. Like uh, just oh yeah, that, that, let me go into that one. So he comes home drunk, and apparently he had ran something over. We, I was just praying it wasn't a person. And so in his drunk mind, so he gets home in his tour of car, because, you know, and he gets his car in the driveway. And then my brand new truck, he decides that he's, he's going to move my truck. So he tears up two vehicles in one night. I'm in the bed, sleep. He comes in, wild out. Mom, you got to get up. I just tore up your car. I just tore just, just up. Y'all didn't mean to. I just tore up the truck. I'm like, man, just get out of my room, man. Just close the door. Just, just. He's like, no, you got to come see it. I'm like, no, just close the door. So that next morning when I get up, I'm like, I'm hoping that was a dream, like a bad dream. And I go upside, I go outside. Sure enough, Quentin had uh, kind of tore up the, got some, the driver's side of my truck. And I, you know, at this point, I'm like, it's so surreal. You just, you, I had to laugh because I wanted to kill him. But I'm like, and then I go look at his car. So now I'm tripping out like, oh my God, like, did he kill somebody? Like what happened? And how do you, I'm still trying to figure out how do you tear up two vehicles in one night? But um, anyway. Well, it was, I can't park on the street and you got to leave out for work in the morning. So, See, so we got this weird drunken respect <laughs> level still going. Like, 
you know, it's just really strange. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go back to, but uh, yeah, so today I went to school and she's, you know, she's pouring her heart out to me and telling me, you know, I don't know what to do at this point. I want to get to help. I'm like, look, I mean, you know, like counseling kept coming up and I'm like, no, the counseling, like anti-counseling. I did counseling when I was really like, I'm not, I'm not on that. So I basically told her, like I said, I got myself into this and I, I can get myself out of it. But also it was a 25 year old brain doing that too. So it was like, I'm kind of over all the hanging out, partying, you know, these meaningless jobs. I kept, I always kept the job, but they were always trash jobs. I mean, what else can you do when you have only graduated from high school? And, you know, at one point it was like a janitor at a hotel or something, not a janitor, but cleaning at a hotel. And I'm like, Yo, I can't do this. Like cleaning up behind people, that kind of thing. So it was just all coming in full circle at the right time. And we had the conversation. I said, I got myself into this. I'll get myself out of it. And I just, focused it just like the focus level just snapped in there uh if it wasn't for that conversation I, I was at wit's end too at that point like i wasn't suicidal but i was just like whatever happens will happen like if it's my time to go you were reckless you were yeah. real reckless though very reckless uh-huh. but uh-huh. to that to that subject i would say this um and to all the moms and dads out there you know as they always say you teach them and they will come back to what they know is true. Because if you hear in the one thing that Quentin is saying throughout everything that he's saying, when he was quote unquote out there, it never felt right. He never really felt like himself. That 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 structure, that that upbringing, that solidness was always still there. The other thing um, I would like to say is that in that moment, and the one thing that I, I did tell him, like, I'm like, dude, I'm broken. I mean, even right now it makes me a little, whew, but, um, when he looked me in my eye, cause he tried to laugh it out like, no, mom, I'm good. And when he saw me like, no, I'm for real. Like this, you have a serious problem. And you like this, I see the premonitions. This is not gonna go well. And when he looked me in my face, real straight, we right here. And he said, you know what? I got myself into this and I'll get myself out. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, all right. At this point, I'm like, does that mean funeral? I'm not even sure, but I can tell you that he stuck to his word. He went back to school. He did all kinds of things. He 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 figured it out. And um that following year is when he started to work with the students. He, you know, here's the thing, beauty, beauty of it. He would always get in just enough trouble. But of course, you know the beauty in it. We all know people. Um, I don't know um if one of my dear friends is on the line, but um one of the best attorneys in Cleveland is a really true friend and probably praise God for him because none of this stuff that he got involved with as many times as he branded with the law, none of it stuck with his record. So he was still able to work in a, in a school with students. Wow, a blessing. Yeah. But that you, a, a, you know, you know, people, I, I turned in a lot of markers to cover Quentin, so to say, but when it got to that point that literally I would have the nightmare every night, that either I was coming to identify a body or um, because it was this whole thing, I'm going out blazing. I felt like that was his energy. And I'm just like, this doesn't make sense. And so when I had that conversation um, coming from a very broken place, because I'm still working 99 jobs I'm doing, because at that time, um, they say it takes a village. But I think for me, keeping myself busy, keeping myself focused on the things that I could handle because this situation was so out of control. And I felt like, well, however it goes down, people know I tried. Mm-hmm. And, and that was my, that was my mentality. I work as hard as I do for you to just be out here doing what, what, what the are you doing? And I, I loved my son, but I despised what was going on. And a lot of my just watching it was like, I want to see what this is. I didn't know if it was just a, boy to man phase um I was talking to some of the males in my life at the time um and most people's re- respond to that was oh he just spoiled you spoiled him you this you that and I'm like oh yeah I really want to hear that okay so when we had that moment where he took that lead and he took that reign on his life you know I even had people say well you know you drink I got to do with anything like 
okay, you know, that's what I got from a lot of my Christian friends. Like, you know, will you drink? Oh, oh okay. Um, so that's not okay to say yeah, that. Yeah, like I just okay. want to ask a question. Um, just if you had advice for parents that are going through this right now, um, mm-hmm. whether it's high school or you know, a lot of us have high schoolers or young adults. You know, mm-hmm. I I heard you say listening. I heard you say patience. You know, there's clearly uh, one of the our um, village members said, Clinton, thank you so much for sharing your thinking during the phases of your life. You've pr- provided so much insight into understanding some of the thoughts of my son. You've helped me to develop more empathy. But yeah. I would love to just just build on that. Like, what would you, what advice would you give to parents on how to deal with our children who might be going through some of the same things? The one thing that I would say to your parent to other parents, keep talking. I mean, I know you want you if you notice the one thing that Quentin said was I I kept talking. I might not have that that talk that conversation in the moment that I knew that he was blazed up, but I was gonna come back to it. We were gonna always keep talking, keep talking, mm-hmm. um, and talk with them. Don't talk at them. See where they at. What is this? You know, keep talking, they hear you. Keep talking, make them accountable. I mean, Quentin, when he was in, where were you? So what happened? What were you doing? Oh, mom, you don't want to no, tell me. Because my thing was, if you are not comfortable with telling me what you're doing, then maybe you ought not be doing it. Okay. And so I would sit there and listen. Like, so we're, we're, oh, we was in the club. Let me tell you what happened. Cause then he get excited. Cause he's like, all right, you know, But the one thing that I would say is keep talking. Let them know you have a problem with it. Let them know that you love them and this is not okay. Keep talking. I think he would get like- I would say to piggyback off of that a little bit, the one thing that, you know, a lot of people now they even like, they're very like, oh, I'm so jealous of a relationship you and your mom have because there was a thing where I did, no matter what it was, no matter how bad it was, no matter the worst of you could possibly think of. I've always felt comfortable telling my mom, like, yo, mom, I just get this crazy, you know, and we would talk about it. I always felt comfortable enough going to her because I knew she wouldn't trip in the moment. You know, she would come back to me a little bit later, like, okay, now let's talk about that. But like, I knew there was a safe space where I could tell her like anything, like, and shake her head, <laughs> go away, come back later, like, okay, now what did you say to me? <laughs> now what did you do you know um uh, and that was that was important uh i think that that helped um because i did have, like you know and now our relationship today is like that's my best friend you know mm. so i could still tell her about anything like you know but i had that open line of communication with her so i definitely would say that that's huge when the question was asked how did you feel when i was asking you those questions Oh, uh, there was times I didn't feel like answering. I was like, you know, <laughs> what? You know what I mean? Like, but I think we'd had, it had developed at such a young age that we had that. So it was like, I mean, from seven, you know, it was like, or even earlier than that, you know, Quentin, why'd you do that? I don't know. I don't know. It's not a good enough answer. Why did you do that? And then I would explain myself. Well, I would, so I've always had that, you know, Mm-hmm. where it was that rapport where we like talk about things um, oh great uh, I would say um, for insight and things like uh, and understanding I think the biggest thing especially for a younger generation I think one is just to, one is try to be empathetic a little because it is this growing from young man to man to adult phase that's uh especially being black, um, you're marketed at to be a certain way um, and you're constantly getting pulled in that direction, that if the home values are there, the the spirit of who you are is always going to remain. And it takes a while, like, you know, for me, like I said, I probably was until 25, 26 that things started to click. But it wasn't until I got tired of the meaningless jobs and, and all the, you know, BS of dealing with certain type of people that it was like, yo, I need, I gotta get out of this. And then to have that conversation as I'm thinking that at that moment and seeing my mom like that, that's what really brought me there, like to the other side of it. And 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 like knowing you don't have to be rah, 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 rah all the time. 
as long as you know that if something pop off, you 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 know how to handle a situation, but you don't have to address, you know, you don't have to be that all the time. If something happens, you respect all, and you, you know, you go about your life this way, but you don't have to be 24 seven. I'm on, I'm on, you know, guard on. So um, just having that, I think if I had to give advice, I would just say have the empathy and having the, you know, the, how do I say it? I want to say like kind of uh, understanding of try to get to know the trigger, I guess, you know, what is the catalyst that's causing the, you know, other, is it, is it strictly, cause every case is different. Every situation is different, but is it strictly like, you know, uh, in, uh, I want to fit in an in crowd kind of thing, or I'm just constantly marketed as this and I, I just want to, you know, uh, be a part of, of that. Or is it, you know, some internal, like, I hate the word like demons, so that's such a cliche thing, but some internal pain or uh, issues that has it really been addressed? Like, what is it that's, that's, that's hitting you there? And it's a, it's a deep conversation to have. And it's like, you got to pick and choose it and, and, and kind of pick at it, but not, you know, we're going to get to the bottom of this right now. Like, no, I ain't trying to talk about that right now. I'm trying to talk to you, like, mm. on, my, on my time. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and when our times meet at the, when you find me in that right mode, we can go there and let's go. I ain't on it. Like you ain't, you're not gonna force me to like you know right. talk to, to you. talk. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I would say also, um, Kelly, with that, and thank you, Quentin, for that. Um, the the cool thing about it is when you leave that space, when they know that you want to talk, at some point they will come around. When they in this mantic, uh, macho, me against the world phase, mm-hmm. you know, it does kind of work. Um, and being able to to navigate that thing of, all right, let, let's see where you're going with this. You know, um, the biggest thing that I would say, too, is, you know, at the end of the day and at the, at the beginning of the day, in all of that, and Quentin, you can vouch for this, he knew that the love was there. I mean, there was some times I was like, I mean, I came right out and said, man, if you want a death wish, I love you enough to kill you. And he looked at me like, wait, what? No, that's where we at, man. I'm serious. Like, at least that way I know to be quick and easy. You know, um, and was and said it very strong. You know, I know we're getting to a point where we're running out of time and this was more um, unedited, um, raw, you know. Um, Quentin, thank you, um, son, for your honesty. You know, it was cool. He asked me, what do we want to talk about? I'm like, you, you we're going to just be real. This is not scripted. Right. This is, you know, we, we, people have tried so many different things, the counseling, um, the, the grounding, the, all of those different things, you know, Kelly, you're in it right now. And I'm sure, you know, looking at this, seeing this, um, every time Quentin and I have a conversation, trust and believe, I hear something new about that lifetime, like I just did right now. So, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? There's a woman or, or a man that has been trying to say something for a really long time. So I just want to give her or yeah. him an opportunity. Yeah. Oh, 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 thank you, Kelly. Hi. Thank you so much. And Quentin, thank you so much. And thank you, Mom of Quentin, uh, for your openness. And uh, so much of what you said resonated with me, particularly, uh, Mom, of what you said right now, last about, like, you know, just, okay, if you want to just kill yourself by what you're doing, let me just do it. Because, you know, I've had talks with friends about my 20-year-old, and I, because I have this great fear, like, God, please don't let him wind up in prison. That's worse than living. Please don't let him, you know, get involved with something that's going to kill him. And so I have all these thoughts, like, but if he went out some other way, like a car accident, it will be relieved, but at least I know he's not in jail. Because then I would die. Because if he gets in jail, I'm dead. I'm dead. My life ends there at that moment. So I'm always having these weird premonitions. So my question for both of you is you both have such a degree of patience and what I'm trying and what you said, Quentin, about choosing your moments to talk, that so resonated with me. Thank you for saying that because I'm an immediate person. I want to resolve things now. Tell me now, what's going on? What's going on? And my someone walk away saying, I can't talk about this right now. Just let me go. I can't do this right now. And I struggle with that. So thank you for saying that because 
coming from you, someone who's been through that, who's been on the other side, I just want to really say thank you. And I don't know how your, you and your mom learned to do that, or if that was just a synergy in your relationship, well, that she was always that way. So mom, can you talk to that? Were you yeah, always I, that way or was that learned behavior? I'm going to tell you, um, thank you. And thank you for listening. And I'm glad that that resonated for you. Um, that is a real strong example of doing the opposite of what my mother did. My mother was a in your face. You're going to talk to me right now. Da, 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 like very aggressive. Um, you know, she was a single mom way before it was popular. And so I could not stand. I still don't like, if you want to shut me down and get me real quiet, come, come with all of that in my face, this, that, and the other. And I knew I never heard half of what she was talking about when she got in that, that, phase. So that came from programming of what I would not do if I, if and when I ever had a child, even if I was upset. And people will know that know me, even when I'm upset, I get quiet. I get real quiet. And that creates a neutral space to be able to be heard. Because even like with my mom and when she would get wild out or whatever, I'm like, well, would you, don't talk back, blah, blah, blah. you know, so all of that, that's, that's where that came from. Just, I decided that I was going to do, you know, a 180 on how I was raised. And especially in those moments, because everybody can be, or what they think they can be a great parent when everything is all perfect and golden and lovely and rainbows and butterflies. But how are you turning up when it turns up? So right. that's- that's so great. And I want to make, there's another question. I know we're over time, so if people can stay a few extra minutes. I think that would be awesome. And we'll wrap up in just a few minutes. Uh, there's a question here about therapy and your resistance to therapy. And um, can you share more about why you resisted going to therapy? And is there any perspective or advice, Clinton, that you would have to getting that to feel more um, accessible for people? Or more helpful? Um, for me, personally, um, one, I never thought I had a problem. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't view what I was doing as a problem. So for me, therapy is for people who have issues, who have, uh, th you know, an issue, you know, a substance abuse problem or something like that. I never viewed it that way. I'm just going out having fun. You know, I'm, I'm just living life. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not, well, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not doing, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so to me, therapy just put a spin on it, like, okay, what, I, what I'm doing is a problem. I never really want to. That's exactly what my son says. That's exactly what my son says. He doesn't need his medicine, doesn't need therapy. He's not doing anything wrong. He's just having and fun. I, <laughs> right. And I want to, I want to piggyback that also, because after um, Quentin's dad died, his, um, his, his stepdad died, he um, was in therapy for like two years. And I think being in therapy at that time at a young age, based on the fact that it was because of grief. So to him, I think it was like, well, I'm not grieving. I'm fine. I'm partying. Like, why would I be in therapy now? I've done that. And I got through it and I'm cool, I think. And that was the biggest problem. He didn't think he had a problem. But everybody else knew he had a problem. But he was like, they don't know me. It was just ridiculous. So, I mean, yeah. one last question. I just want to ask you: If you, what would you tell your younger self today? Uh, or would you tell yourself to do anything differently? Uh, you know, I I've been asked that before, and I always said I, I don't think that I would do anything different because it shaped me and the way I am now. There's a couple things like, man, do you take that? a uh, college offer and you, you go play ball at, you know, division two school, or maybe go pro because some of the guys who I was a lot better than went pro, you know, and had that life. Or, but outside of things like that, no, because it's a lot of the uh, things that I've learned through life, or, you know, it's like the child, you know, you tell them don't stick your finger in the socket, don't stick your finger in the socket, but until they stick their finger in the socket, they'll never know. And they get shocked and they're like, okay, never do that again. So I've, I've, I've taken a lot of hits, in life, but I've also learned from those hits and um, it's helped me navigate that way now I work in the corporate world. Um, I'm a lot 
uh, stronger in the corporate world than a lot of people because I do have such a different dynamic coming into it um, or a different background coming into it that I'm not like, just a college kid who's never been through things. So I'm, I'm very adamant of speaking up for myself or, hey, I, you know, I need this to happen. I need this to happen this way. I'm very strong in my, my, my thought process and very strong in my vocal of what things that I say. So I get things accomplished that probably doesn't happen for the average person. Mm-hmm. Not only my age, my race, uh, just everything. Uh, mm-hmm. If it was, if I don't have that, I got nothing to lose attitude or, you know, I don't think I'll be as far along as I am. So what I, do I regret any of it? There's parts of it. Definitely. I might look back. Like, whew, like wow. Uh, but would I do it any other way? Probably. That's super helpful. Well, with that, I just want to make sure that you know that so many people have said thank you, thank you, thank you for today, for your insight, for sharing your perspective, and how beautiful the mutual respect and love is. It's so clear to see. Um, so I just want to make sure that you uh, have seen that and felt that energy. Um, I know, especially Tamiko is an energy specialist. Um, I want to, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly Chapman to do a prayer. And before I do that, I just want to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. You all have shed so much amazing insight and perspective to all of us today. And uh, just appreciate everybody. Appreciate you both. Thank you all all for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for showing up. And uh, thank you, Tamiko and Quentin. I love you both. Just a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Father God, we come to you with thanks. We counted a blessing to hear from Tamiko Ruby J and her son, Quentin. Thank you, God, for connecting the Sunrise Project with these two transparent and giving hearts. Lord, we come to you today asking for discernment. Our children face many choices in life. Oftentimes, we as parents miss the signs or we fail to handle difficult situations in a way that our children feel heard, understood, or loved. Help us to discern what is going on with our children and to be wise parents. In turn, we trust that our children will always feel comfortable and will want to share with us. We also ask for empathy and self-control of God. Oftentimes, we as parents operate out of sadness, fears, disappointments, and sometimes outright rage at the failed expectations we set for our children. Lord, soften our hearts to let go of the anger and to season our speech with salt. Lord, give us the ear to hear and patience that will allow us to be slow to anger. Give us a stern but loving countenance so that our children won't run from us, but will run to us in their times of distress. We say to you, God, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until the destroying storms pass by. We put our hope and trust in you, Lord, giving thanks in advance. We rejoice in the hope of your glorious outcomes. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kelly. So awesome. Everybody have a beautiful day. Thank you again. Uh, We'll see you next week and really, really appreciate your time. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'm Kelly Richardson Lawson, and you've been listening to the Sunrise Project podcast. You can follow Sunrise wherever you listen to podcasts. If you haven't yet, open your podcast app and follow this show. Join us next week for another gathering of support. Thank you for listening. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental wellness challenges, contact your doctor, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or both. You can reach NAMI's helpline at 800-950-6264, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, or email at info at NAMI.org. Volunteers are working to answer questions, offer support, and provide practical next steps.